we had a lot of data flow this week, uh, and I'd like your reaction to it. And let's lead off with the lead, which is those CPI numbers of 7%. It's been a good long time since we've seen that kind of number. It has, uh, David. Uh, Richard Nixon imposed wage price controls when inflation was about two-thirds as high as it's been last year. This is above any place it got during the guns and butter uh, Vietnam inflation. I think the data flow is saying what I've thought for quite some time, that, yes, there are transitory elements in inflation, and very likely they will recede, but we are basically moving towards uh, higher entrenched inflation. It's there in expectations. It's there in wages. It's there in uh, labor shortages. It's there in the pervasive pattern across uh, many different uh, prices. And people try to excuse it by picking this figure and that figure from uh, month to month. But we've got an overheated economy. And the Fed's going to have the very real challenge of cooling that economy uh, off um, and doing it in a controlled way. That has not been done very successfully uh, in uh, the past. So it's going to be a very challenging year for macroeconomic policy. And I suspect that the approach depends on what the causes are of the underlying inflation. And we have various candidates put forward. For example, we talked with Brian Deese. You know him well from the White House this week. He said, well, really, this is a supply side problem. Once we get the supply chain fixed, it'll be, it'll be all fixed. Is he right? No. He's wrong. Uh, we have a massive overheated labor market. We have the highest ratio of vacancies to unemployment in the country's history by a large margin. We have shortages of labor in everything from psychotherapy uh, to McDonald's, in everything from investment analysts to uh, garters. That suggests a surfeit of purchasing power and demand relative to the capacity of the economy uh, to uh, produce. And unless we bring those things into balance, we're going to have not just higher inflation, but possibly even uh, accelerating uh, inflation. And we need to recognize that we have an overheated economy that we are going to need uh, to cool off um, in uh, the time to come. And until we do that, it is going to be much more difficult uh, to address uh, the problem. Yes, we need to do what we can to open up ports. Yes, if there was anything we could do to cause there to be more semiconductors, uh, that would be good. Yes, better child care arrangements to enable more women uh, to work uh, would uh, be desirable. But fundamentally, this inflation is about um, an overheating economy, and that's the thing that uh, we have to address. Every time a Washington policymaker suggests that this is caused by corporate greed or some such. They are delaying the date at which we will achieve the credibility necessary to bring down inflation with stable employment. They are raising the risk that we are going to need uh, the kind of, which I sure hope we can avoid and I think we can avoid, the kind of drastic contraction that was necessary when Paul Volcker became chairman of the Fed. But misdiagnosis of the problem around greed or around particular sectors raises the risk that ultimate recession will be necessary. All of which takes us back to your statement that it's pretty difficult for the Fed to have a soft landing here. The track record is not unblemished, I think it's fair to say. Uh, with the three new nominees from President Biden, he will have basically put five people in place, renominating Jay Powell as chair, 
promoting his proposal is promoting Leo Brandon, and then three new members. What do we know about these people? What does it say about the Constitution of the Fed going forward, assuming they get confirmed? Let me say that I strongly support uh, the reconfirmation of uh, Jay Powell, and I strongly support uh, Lael Brainerd's nomination to be uh, vice chair of uh, the Fed. I think that the three new nominees who don't have a track record on uh, the Fed will have an opportunity to present uh, their views on uh, inflation and on the challenges they will face in dealing with an overheating uh, economy. The president has made clear his commitment to the independence of uh, the Fed. Part of that commitment is allowing and encouraging the Fed to be focused on its fundamental jobs of maintaining a non-inflationary economy with as strong employment as is possible on a sustained basis. If a sense develops that there's a desire to politicize the Fed by focusing it towards other issues beyond the crucial issues of uh, financial stability, I think that could be problematic for uh, the Fed's credibility. And so it will be very important uh, to for the nominees who have distinguished track records in different uh, areas in the past to present their views uh, to uh, Congress and for Congress to very seriously consider those views. Uh, finally, Larry, we can't summarize the week without talking about COVID-19 and the Omicron variant as we have record numbers this week coming in, at least of the disease being contracted. I'm curious about where you think we are in dealing with the pandemic. And more pointedly, uh, in the past on this program, you questioned, particularly during the Trump administration, the competence of the government. Were they de demonstrating competence in the way they handled it? At this point, is the Biden administration demonstrating competence in the way it's handling the pandemic? It is so much easier to be on the outside and criticize and uh, carp and judge things in retrospect that I'm reluctant uh, to pass judgment on uh, what the Biden administration uh, has done. Certainly, uh, we now need to be focused on much more than vaccination, on rapid dissemination of treatment, particularly on uh, the availability of tests. I wish those things had happened uh, faster. I wish the CDC and the FDA had broken more out of their conventional rhythms to reflect the extraordinary situation uh, that uh, we're dealing with. But I would underscore one thing, David, and that is that COVID anywhere is a risk of mutation that could lead to catastrophe everywhere and that we are underinvesting as a global system on a massive scale in the global effort to uh, contain uh, COVID. And in addition to its moral significance around the world, we are making it more likely that the next uh, vaccine, uh, the next COVID strain will have Omicron's transmissibility and some other strains uh, lethality. And that is a grave risk to uh, the global system and one that I think is not getting enough attention. You know, one of the things that I think is very, very important in government is to hope for the best, but to plan for the worst. And I think in a whole set of areas uh, that the administration, even as it tries so hard to present an optimistic uh, vision, and that is so important to do, needs to be ensuring against uh, the downside outcomes. And global COVID is one of those outcomes.